Hello everybody, I'm Dan Merle and welcome to another edition of Charts with Dan. We have a lot to break down at the box office from this past weekend, including Hollywood's mega couple of the moment, Ryan Reynolds and Blake Lively dominating at number one and number two at the box office. And let's jump right into the top five from this past weekend. Deadpool and Wolverine spends a third week at number one and a third week over $50 million, just a 44% drop from last weekend at $54.1 million. Its domestic total is now approaching $500 million. It ends with us starring Blake Lively, who is married to Deadpool himself, Ryan Reynolds, comes in second place at $50 million estimated, although I've seen some reports that it may come in slightly under 50, but still, that is a very impressive debut for a movie that really wasn't on a lot of people's radars even a few weeks ago, certainly not on mine to this degree. So we have another great movie breaking through in August that's gonna help us recover from that slow start in the summer, and we'll see where that final number comes in. But with a budget around reportedly 25 to $30 million, that's a great start for It Ends With Us. In third place is Twisters, which has just been doing well in the background. It's been in the shadow of bigger movies like Deadpool and Wolverine every week since it's opened. It drops 34.2% in week four, another $15 million. Its domestic total is now at $222 million. And again, that would be absolutely fantastic. And it is domestically. The issue is that it hasn't been doing as well internationally. But still, the fact that it has such a strong draw domestically in theaters means that it should see strong results from premium video on demand, etc. This movie is going to break even, just not necessarily in the theatrical window. In fourth place is the disaster story of the weekend, which is Borderlands, which had a budget around 110 to $120 million reportedly. It opens in fourth place at $8.8 million. That's just a disaster, and we'll talk more about it in a few minutes. Coming in fifth was Despicable Me 4, which dropped 30.2% in its sixth week of release, another $8 million, and a domestic total right around $330 million. M. Night Shyamalan's Trap comes in sixth place. It drops 56.5%, not great, but not as bad as it could have been. It's at $6.7 million. Its domestic total now at $28.6 million, and it's going to have to do some work in order to climb out of the M. Night Shyamalan box office basement. Inside Out 2 spends a ninth week in the top 10. It comes in seventh place at $4.95 million. It drops just 27.2% from last weekend. And it jumped over the domestic gross of Barbie this week. It's about $17 million shy of Jurassic World for number 10 all-time domestically. We'll see if it can get there, but it now has Deadpool and Wolverine on its left. So it's possible that it could set that number 10 mark all time domestically and then get almost immediately overtaken by its R rated companion in the top 10. In eighth place was Harold and the Purple Crayon. It started out DOA, it remains DOA. It dropped 48.4% in its second week, brought in $3.1 million for a domestic total of $12.8 million. In ninth place is Cuckoo, the latest buzzy horror film from Neon. Not quite able to replicate what happened with Long Legs earlier this summer. It brings in $3 million, but again, this was a low budgeted film and we'll see how it sticks around at the box office and in 10th place is long legs so we have two neon horror films next to each other in the top 10 i think that's a great thing i see this as an absolute win long legs in its fifth week drops 52.5 percent adds another two million dollars domestically so let's talk about a few of the movies that are in the top 10 and we'll start of course with the number one movie which is deadpool and wolverine it now has pretty much surpassed the only box office milestone domestically as far as the X-Men franchise that it had not already crossed. It is now the number one X-Men movie, even when you adjust for inflation, passing the first Deadpool. So it is now the top grossing X-Men film or X-Men franchise film by any box office metric domestically. Also looking at the franchise tracker for the MCU, Deadpool and Wolverine is now the sixth highest grossing MCU film of all time domestically. It's past movies like Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness, Captain Marvel, Black Panther, Wakanda Forever, and Avengers Age of Ultron. But it has a pretty stiff barrier if it wants to break into the top five because ahead of it is the Avengers at $623.3 million. I don't know if Deadpool and Wolverine is going to get there necessarily, but it's going to get pretty close. If it doesn't catch the Avengers, it will be an interesting race to watch. So a top five, top six Marvel movie domestically 
for Deadpool and Wolverine. When you look at the MCU adjusted for inflation, Deadpool and Wolverine is now a top 10 film all time. It's past Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, Black Panther Wakanda Forever, Spider-Man Far From Home, and the original Iron Man. And it is within easy striking distance of Captain Marvel, Captain America Civil War, Iron Man 3, and Avengers Age of Ultron. But it's not going to get higher than number 6 because the 5th highest grossing film is Avengers Infinity War at $808 million. So it looks like Deadpool and Wolverine will be the 6th highest grossing film of the MCU adjusted for inflation and looking at the race for what will be the number one movie of summer 2024 the yellow line there is deadpool and wolverine the pink line is inside out too and you can see through 17 days of release that deadpool and wolverine maintains its lead over inside out too but if you look at this past weekend i think that that is narrowing ever so slightly i think it is going to be a close race between these two films to see what will be the number one movie of the summer it's probably going to come down to the wire but i think we do see some tightening there with inside out too regardless both of these movies are massive mega hits and both of these movies are from disney so to disney it doesn't really matter but to me you know i like to keep track of the records all right so let's talk about it ends with us which has become a late summer sleeper hit or at least one that wasn't on a lot of people's radars at the beginning of the summer certainly was not on mine we see this a lot where a movie breaks out in August unexpectedly. It could be, I think, a top 10 summer movie, depending on how it does in the next few weeks, and also how Alien Romulus does, which I think is the last movie that hasn't opened yet that has a legit shot at the top 10. And when we look at 2024, as far as non-sequels or remakes, It Ends With Us is the highest opening film of the year. It's $50 million gross, perhaps a little bit lower when the actual numbers come in. Is that number one? If is in second place. Then we have Bob Marley, One Love, which opened to $28.6 million. The Fall Guy, which is an adaptation of the TV show, but not a remake of another film. Civil War is in fifth place. The Garfield movie, I put it six. That might be controversial. But again, the Garfield movie is not a direct sequel to a previous Garfield film. So I'm not counting it as a sequel. Long Legs is in 7th, Argyle's in 8th, again, it did not advertise any sort of connection to the Kingsman universe, The Beekeeper is in ninth, and Trap is in 10th, so really, as far as non-sequels go, It Ends With Us had the widest appeal as far as opening weekend of any movie so far, note that with If in 2nd place, we yet again have a Blake Lively, Ryan Reynolds pairing at number 1 and number 2 on this list. And when we look at the highest grossing opening weekends for Blake Lively overall domestically, now this excludes voice and cameo appearances, so Deadpool and Wolverine and F are not on this list. At number one was Green Lantern. She cannot get away from Ryan Reynolds. They weren't even married yet. And yet here they are again at number one and number two on this list. The $53.1 million opening for Green Lantern back in 2011 brings it in just over It Ends With Us, which is Blake Lively's second biggest opening in her career. The Town from 2010 is in third place at $23.8 million. Then we have The Shallows from 2016, which I think is one of the more underrated modern shark films, in fourth place at $16.8 million dollars and savages from 2012 in fifth place at just over 16 million dollars now usually at the end of the show i do something called the box office flashback where we look back at a weekend in box office history but we're going to bump it up to the beginning of the show because it is relevant to what we saw at number one and number two at the box office this weekend i want to go back to the last time according to my records or my research maybe something snuck through since then that we had a married couple in two different movies at number one and number two at the box office. And we have to go back to 1990, July 13th through the 15th, 1990. It was the second weekend of release for Die Hard 2, which had a 33.3% drop and had a $14.5 million second weekend. But it was also the opening weekend of Ghost, starring Bruce Willis's then wife, Demi Moore, at $12.1 million. The next week, these films actually switched places. So they spent two weeks at the top of the box office together. I don't know if that's going to happen with Alien Romulus hitting the marketplace this weekend as far as the repeat, but this weekend actually gets a little bit crazier because in third place is Days of Thunder, which was in its third week of release. That movie starred Tom Cruise, and on the set of that film, he met his future wife, Nicole Kidman, who's also in the movie. So we had one currently married couple at number one and number two, one future Hollywood mega couple in a movie together in third place, 
But then things get even a little bit weirder. I'm not talking about the re-release of Disney's The Jungle Book at number four. I'm talking about the number five film, which was The Adventures of Ford Fairlane, starring Andrew Dice Clay. He was a very controversial comedian back in the 80s and 90s, if you don't remember him. The Adventures of Ford Fairlane was directed by Rennie Harlan, who was also the director of Die Hard 2. He shot Die Hard 2 after The Adventures of Ford Fairlane, but those two movies came out the same weekend, and this is where it gets even crazier. Opening that same week at number seven was the movie Quick Change, starring Gina Davis, who three years later would marry Rennie Harlan, the director of Die Hard 2 and The Adventures of Ford Fairlane. So in just one weekend's top 10 back in 1990, we had three current or future high-profile Hollywood couples all sharing the box office landscape. Honestly, even if this wasn't the last time a married couple were at number one and number two at the box office, this would be the weekend that I'd show you because this is why I like doing the show. You do a deep dive like this and you find this seemingly random series of events that all come together. That's why people say, why do you like the box office so much, Dan? It's things like that. It's not really consequential. It's just kind of weird and cool. All right, enough of this talking about movies that did well. Let's talk about the big bomb of the weekend, which was Borderlands. And let's look at some of the stats on this movie. It was the fourth worst wide opening ever for Kate Blanchett, meaning a movie that opened in 1,000 theaters or more. It was also the fourth worst wide opening for Eli Roth. It was Kevin Hart's sixth worst wide opening weekend, Jamie Lee Curtis's seventh worst wide opening weekend, and Jack Black's 11th worst wide opening. And keep in mind, this is without adjusting any of these numbers for inflation. It probably would fare much, much worse in most cases if you were to do that. It was also the worst wide opening weekend for a video game movie excluding the COVID year of 2020 since Ratchet and Clank back in 2016. If you include the year 2020, then it would be the lowest video game movie opening since Monster Hunter, which did open wide, but was in the later part of the year, and really at a time when not many people were going to the movies. And this was also the worst opening of 2024 for a movie with a 100 plus million dollar budget. Is this the biggest bomb of the year? Well, it's certainly in the running. We've had movies with bigger budgets like Furiosa, a Mad Max saga that were box office disappointments, but they made way more than this movie is going to make. It's not doing well domestically. It wasn't even in the top five worldwide this past weekend. Unless some country comes in and saves Borderlands from a terrible box office fate, even though it has a lower budget point, I think it is possible that it will be the biggest box office bomb of the year so far. And I will keep track of that gross and bring you those calculations as we know more. We don't quite know enough after opening weekend to know exactly where it's gonna land, but I think it's in contention. And really, I didn't think that we'd see a movie this year worse than something like Madam Web, which I thought was pretty horrible. Borderlands is, I think, a worse movie. I know some people said that they enjoyed it. I got the old, you don't know how to enjoy a fun movie, turn off your brain, etc. that I get when I dislike any movie. Uh, but I think that it was a worse film. And the audience obviously didn't really care for it either. It got a D plus cinema score. Word of mouth was atrocious on the movie. Every movie has its fans and Borderlands certainly has a few supporters that gave me an earful this weekend. Uh, but I do not see this movie being set up for success. And um, yeah, this could be the flop of the year. We're just going to have to wait and see. One more quick note on a movie in the top 10. Long Legs has officially passed Civil War as the second highest grossing film based on no IP, basically, an original intellectual property. It's not going to catch If, which is about $30 million ahead of it, but still very impressive for a small indie film from an indie distributor that had a very cheap, non-traditional marketing campaign. And Long Legs will be one of the more lucrative films of the year. Looking at movies that dropped out of the top 10, A Quiet Place Day One is out after six weeks, The Firing Squad is out after one week, and Ponyo, which is a film from Studio Ghibli. It was part of the annual Studio Ghibli Fest and actually made the top 10 last week when final numbers came in. It is out after one week, so one after six weeks and then two movies out after one week. And looking at the biggest theater count changes for this past weekend, Wong Legs had the biggest loss of theaters. It lost 840 of them, but it's still in wide release. It's in 1,310 theaters. A Quiet Place Day One is now out of wide release. It dropped 571 theaters. It remains in 468 of them. Kneecap, which I thought was a really good indie movie about an Irish hip hop band, 
Lost 499 of its 700 or so theaters. It remains in just 204. And this is disappointing because you see this all the time. An indie movie comes out, you have one week to see it, and then it's gone. I wish theaters are able to give these movies more runway to give people time to discover them. Kneecap is not a movie that has a huge marketing budget. It's going to rely on word of mouth. And by the time you hear about it, it's out of theaters. So if you didn't see Kneecap in theaters, look for it on streaming, I'm sure, very soon because I thought that it was a really fun movie. Inside Out 2 loses another 415 theaters. It's now in 2,200 theaters total. It's got a few that it could have given a kneecap, surely. And The Firing Squad loses 370 theaters. It is now in 440 theaters total. Looking at what I like to call our road to recovery, the red line is the box office weekend average for the years 2021 through 2023. The blue line is the box office weekend average for the years 2015 through 2019. And that dotted black line is the weekend total for every weekend this year. And you can see that we spend yet another week ahead of the average, not only where we've been, but where we were pre-pandemic that's boosted by Deadpool and Wolverine, but also by the great performance this weekend of It Ends With Us. The highest grossing film in the 2021 to 2023 window was the continued run of Barbie in its third weekend of release last year. The highest grossing film in the 2015 to 2019 window was the debut of Suicide Squad back in 2016. And depending on how Alien Romulus does this upcoming weekend, I think we've got a good shot at staying above both averages. Let's turn now from the domestic box office to the international box office and see what the top five films were outside of the U.S. and Canada. At number one, no surprise, was Deadpool and Wolverine, which brings in $57.8 million from international markets. Then we have It Ends With Us, which pulled in $30 million outside of the domestic marketplace. So it's not just here, it's also out in the world where we see grosses coming in for It Ends With Us. Successor from China with a very small Small domestic footprint, most of this money coming from China, brings in another $24.6 million. Then in fourth place, we have another film from China called Upstream. It's a drama about a stay-at-home husband who suddenly finds himself back in the workforce. $22.7 million for Upstream and $18.7 million for another Chinese film, the animated film White Snake Afloat, the third and final film in the trilogy based on Chinese folktales. When we take the domestic numbers, we add them to those international numbers. We get our top five films worldwide. Deadpool and Wolverine adds another $111.9 million to its worldwide total. It Ends With Us opens to $80 million, which again, given its budget point, is a very, very good opening for a film of its size. It's a very good opening for a film that has doubled the budget, quite frankly. In third place was Despicable Me 4, which dropped 30%. It brought in another $26.7 million. And then we have two Chinese releases, Successor at $24.9 million and Upstream at $22.7 million. Looking at where Deadpool and Wolverine stands as far as the highest grossing R-rated films of all time worldwide, it has passed Oppenheimer. It is now number two all time, and it's less than $50 million behind Joker, which means that this time next week, Deadpool and Wolverine will be the highest grossing R-rated film by every metric worldwide and domestic, except for adjusted for inflation domestically, because there are movies like The Exorcist that are going to come in way above where Deadpool and Wolverine did, but still just an objective success, really. No notes. It's an objective success. When you look at the X-Men franchise by worldwide gross, this hasn't changed from last week, but it does reflect that Deadpool and Wolverine is now the first film in the X-Men franchise to crack $1 billion worldwide, and by a significant margin, Deadpool 2's gross was $786.3 million. And when we look at the MCU as far as worldwide gross, Deadpool and Wolverine becomes the 11th MCU film to make $1 billion. It has passed Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Badness, Spider-Man Homecoming, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, and Black Panther Wakanda Forever. It's about $100 million behind Captain Marvel, which it will reach eventually. And it's pretty close to Spider-Man Far From Home and Captain America Civil War from there. Then we'll see if it gets up into the $1.2, $1.3 billion range to crack that top six or seven. But again, huge success. Nothing really to add there. We've got a lot more to break down from this past weekend, but before we do, I want to thank the sponsors for this week's show. This video is brought to you by The Perfect Gene. 
I don't want to weird you out, but I'd like to talk about my pants for a minute. I'm always looking for a great pair of jeans, and I have some from the Perfect Jean that are exactly what I'm looking for. They look great, they're comfy, and they actually fit me, which is really tough for me to find. And I'm not just saying this because they're talking points in an ad. I mean, they are, but just because they're talking points doesn't make them untrue. The truth is that the Perfect Jean is as advertised. No more stiff denim, no more discomfort in the crotch, aka the work zone. They just just feel great and they're always the first pair that I grab out of the laundry. The Perfect Jean also has a huge range of sizes from 26 to 50 in the waist and 26 to 38 in length. So it doesn't matter whether you're rocking a fab bod or a dad bod, these jeans will fit. I've worn other pairs of fancy jeans before and it's like wearing a suit. I can't wait to get home and change into something more comfortable, but I can wear my perfect jeans all day from screening a movie on my couch at home to screening a movie at a nice theater. And I'm completely comfortable the entire time. It's finally time to stop putting up with uncomfortable jeans by going to theperfectjean.nyc. Our listeners get 15% off your first order, plus free shipping, free returns, and free exchanges when you use code DAN15 at checkout. That's 15% off for new customers at theperfectgene.nyc with promo code DAN15. After you purchase, they'll ask you where you heard about them, so please support our show and tell them that I sent you, F your khakis, and get the perfect jean. This video is brought to you by Miracle Made. I'm going to tell you something right now that you can't unhear. Did you know that traditional bed sheets can harbor more bacteria than a toilet seat? Don't worry, this isn't a criticism of you, it's just how it is. That bacteria can lead to acne, allergies, and stuffy noses, but Miracle Made offers a line of self cleaning antibacterial bedding that prevents up to 99.7% of bacteria growth and requires up to three times less laundry. Miracle Made sheets use silver infused fabrics inspired by NASA that not only stay fresh longer than regular sheets, but are also temperature regulating so you can stay cool and clean all night long. They're also really comfortable, more comfortable than sheets in most of the hotels that I've been to. Honestly, I just start bringing my own sheets when I travel if that didn't put a big dent into my carry-on allowance. Stop sleeping on bacteria and sleep more comfortably today with Miracle Made. Go to trymiracle.com slash Dan to try Miracle Made sheets today and whether you're buying them for yourself or as a gift for a loved one, if you order today, you can save over 40%. And if you use the promo code DAN at checkout, you'll get three free towels and save an extra 20%. Miracle's so confident in their product, it's backed with a 30-day money-back guarantee, so if you aren't 100% satisfied, you'll get a full refund. Upgrade your sleep with Miracle Made. Go to trymiracle.com slash Dan and use the code Dan to claim your free three-piece towel set and save over 40% off. Again, that's trymiracle.com slash Dan to treat yourself. Thank you to Miracle Made for sponsoring this episode. Before we move into some of these specialty charts and look at the summer box office season overall, I wanted to do one quick revision to last week's show in addition to the update about the top 10 that I did earlier. I also wanted to look at the per theater averages from last weekend because there was one film that came into the top five when those final numbers came in. The top two were the same, Deadpool and Wolverine at number one and War Game at number two. But in third place was a one theater showing of a 4K restoration of Army of Shadows, which is Jean-Pierre Melville's 1969 film set during World War II. It made $10,295 in one theater. Army of Shadows, following an initially poor response in France, actually didn't see a U.S. release for almost 40 years after it was put out in France. It came out here in 2006. Many critics named it one of the best films of the year. And now the restoration is showing here in the U.S. This is a great indication, and I've said this before, that while the box office is a key component of a movie's financial success, the actual legacy of a film isn't written in the opening weekend. Sometimes it's not written in the opening year, the opening decade, the opening generation. Sometimes movies just find their audiences over time, and Army of Shadows is a great example of that. Finishing out the revision here, DD comes in fourth place. It made $9,624 last week in 47 theaters. And then Sing Sing comes in fifth place, bringing in $9,142 in 18 theaters. We will see both of these movies again in just a couple of minutes. When we look at the 2024 summer box office picture, nothing has really changed. As I mentioned, we kind of have an entrenched top 10, although I think that It Ends With Us is going to crack into this top 10 and knock off my second movie 
of the summer. And Alien Romulus now is the final wild card. If It Ends With Us is able to outgross the Garfield movie and Alien Romulus makes basically $100 million or close to that, then the Fall Guy and the Garfield movie will both get knocked out of the top 10. And we could have 10 summer movies that are all over $100 million. We'll just have to see what happens with It Ends With Us. Sometimes films like this that are highly anticipated, that are based on books, are very front-loaded, and we see a big drop-off in weekend number two because there's a rush to go see them. We're just going to have to see what it looks like for weekend number two. Looking at some of these specialty charts, this is the per-theater average chart for this past weekend, August 9th through 11th. Deadpool and Wolverine may have won the overall box office competition, but it ends with us won the per-theater average competition. It brought in $13,846 in each of its 3,611 theaters. That is better than Deadpool and Wolverine, which comes in second place but was in more theaters. It brought in $12,512 in each of its 4,330 theaters. In third place is Good One, which is the debut of writer-director India Donaldson about a teenage girl who goes hiking with her father. It premiered at this year's Sundance Film Festival and brought in just over $10,000 per theater in three theaters. Sing Sing comes in fourth place at $5,820 per theater in 39 theaters. This is a very slow rollout for this film from A24. And then we have Twisters in fifth place right now, pending revisions that may pop up on next week's show, bringing in $4,094 per theater in each of its 3,664 theaters. Looking at the top five films in limited release, that's 1,000 theaters or fewer, DD rules the day. It had an expansion to 200 theaters last weekend, and it's expanding to many, many more this upcoming weekend, so check your local listings. $650,000 in 200 theaters, that's good enough for number one. In second place was the Indian film Daro Napinda Hove, which was a top 10 film last weekend before Ponyo ended up being there. It made $293,182 per theater in an unknown number of theaters. Then we had Successor, which as I mentioned, has a small release here domestically. It made $268,904 per theaters in an unknown number of theaters. Then we had The Firing Squad at $245,000 in 440 theaters. And Sing Sing, which expanded to 39 theaters in its fifth week of release, bringing in another $226,965. Looking at the 2024 annual domestic box office, this is movies released in the year 2024. Really just a couple changes here. The top four remain the same with Inside Out 2, Deadpool and Wolverine, Despicable Me 4, and Dune Part 2 pretty entrenched for now, but coming up quickly on Dune Part 2 is Twisters, which is now a top five film domestically for the year. I don't know if it's got another $60 million in the tank, but it was enough to take down Godzilla Kong, The New Empire, which is now number six. The bottom four remain the same, Kung Fu Panda 4, Bad Boys Ride or Die, which is actually getting very close to the domestic total of Kung Fu Panda 4. I think it'll be the number seven movie by the time we do the show next week. Then we have Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes at number nine, and A Quiet Place Day one at number 10. Also no change on the worldwide box office list for 2024, but we now have two billion dollar grocers where just a couple months ago we had zero. Inside Out 2 is at 1.59 billion and Deadpool and Wolverine is at 1.02 billion. Despicable Me 4 is in third, Dune Part 2 is in fourth, and Godzilla Kong The New Empire is in fifth. I will tell you that Successor, the Chinese film that we've talked about a lot, is lurking just outside of the top 10, so we could see it knock out Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes as early as next weekend. Looking at the top grossing films from the past 365 days, we had one film that expired, which was No More Bets. It wasn't on the chart for a full 365, but that one-year window did elapse. So we have Bad Boys Ride or Die at number 10 for right now at just over $400 million. This is basically the top nine movies of 2024 alongside Wonka from 2023. But again, Successor is lurking just outside of the top 10, and we could see it on this chart joining YOLO and Pegasus 2 as early as next weekend. 
So that wraps it up for what's going on at the box office. Let's take a quick look now at the streaming charts and we'll start with what's going on over on Netflix. This is the last week of data we have, which would be for July 29th to August 4th. And the number one movie was Saving Bikini Bottom, which was a Sandy Cheeks spinoff movie from the SpongeBob SquarePants franchise. The fact that this was not on Paramount Plus, which is the home of SpongeBob SquarePants, but was in fact on Netflix is the most Paramount Plus thing that I can imagine. 12.76 million views is able to snag Bikini Bottom, the number one spot. In second place is Non-Negotiable, a Netflix original movie with 8 million views. Then in third place is the debut of a new series, A Good Girl's Guide to Murder, Season 1. This is a series out of the UK about a student who takes on the unsolved murder of a local girl, and it's based on the book series by Holly Jackson. Then we have a few movies that are just new films that hit Netflix. Keep in mind, this covers the first week of the month when Netflix gets a bunch of new licensed titles. So in fourth place, we had Paw Patrol, The Mighty Movie, which was the sequel to the original Paw Patrol movie. In fifth place was Don't Breathe 2. Then we have Trolls Band Together at number six. Find Me Falling at number seven. Jack Reacher, Never Go Back, starring Tom Cruise, is at number eight at 5.39 million views. Failure to Launch, which was one of the Keystone Matthew McConaughey peak rom-com movies, comes in ninth place at 4.8 million views. And then The Bad Guys comes in 10th with 4.2 million views. We'll probably see more Netflix original programming next week when we're not covering a week with a bunch of new movies that are added to the service. Let's turn now to the Nielsen ratings. These are US numbers only and they're delayed by about a month because I guess it takes Nielsen that long to compile all of the data. So these are the top 10 most watched streaming movies for the week of July 8th through the 14th. Beverly Hills Cop Axel F is off of the current Netflix chart because its debut is a little bit more front loaded than a lot of Netflix films. But because we're going back about a month, it is still number one on the Nielsen chart. This is the week after Beverly Hills Cop Axel F was released, and it was the easy number one at 15.2 million hours watched in its second week of release. If made its debut on Paramount Plus back in early July and brought in 10.1 million hours watched. In third place was Divorce in the Black on Amazon Prime Video with 8.3 million hours watched. This is the latest film from Tyler Perry, the second movie in a four movie deal that he has with Amazon, which is apart from the partnership that he also has with Netflix. So Tyler Perry, as always, staying busy. In fourth place is the first Paw Patrol movie, Paw Patrol The Movie, at 6.4 million hours watched. In fifth place was the debut of Descendants, The Rise of Red, the fourth film in the Descendants series on Disney+, Plus, focusing on the daughter of Alice in Wonderland's Queen of Hearts, 6.43 million hours watched, just barely out of that fourth place spot. A Family Affair on Netflix comes in sixth, Godzilla Kong on Max comes in seventh, In eighth place was The Long Game on Netflix, which was a smaller release not too long ago at 5.7 million hours watched. Then we have Inside Out on Disney Plus at 5.3 million hours watched. And I think when Inside Out 2 finally hits the streaming service, those numbers are going to be bananas. And speaking of bananas, Minions on Netflix is at number 10 at 4.7 million hours watched. I legitimately did not plan that, but of course, the Minions always find a way. When we look at the year's most watched streaming movies through July 14th, the Super Mario Brothers movie remains number one, followed by Moana at number two and Damsel at number three. But Beverly Hills Cop Axel F is making a run for that number three spot. It's at 49.4 million hours watched. It's about 10 million hours behind Damsel. We'll see if it can catch up to it. Inside Out is now the fifth most watched streaming movie of the year here in the U.S. That knocks down Roadhouse, Hitman, and Lyft. A Family Affair is now the ninth most watched streaming movie of the year at 38.7 million hours watched. Wish goes down one spot to number 10. And Atlas and Madam Web are both off of the most watched movies of the year chart so far. Looking at the 10 most watched streaming shows for the 8th through the 14th, not a lot of new titles, but I believe this is the first time, or certainly the first time in a while, that House of the Dragon is at number one as the most watched show on streaming at 21.2 million hours. And this is just the people watching on Max. This does not count the people that are watching on cable that watch it on HBO. So the numbers would be even bigger if House of the Dragon was a streaming only show. Bluey comes in second place on Disney+, Plus, followed by Suits and The Boys. 
Love Island is the new title that's on the top 10 list this week at 17.1 million hours watched. Dexter, which was recently put back on Netflix, is at number six, followed by Grey's Anatomy at number seven. Your Honor, which is the big breakout license show of the summer at number eight. And then Family Guy and Bob's Burgers, which are becoming a familiar duo down at numbers nine and ten. Looking at the most watched show by watch time per available episode for July 8th through the 14th, you basically take the total watch time, divide it by the number of episodes, and see what each episode would average. House of the Dragon remains number one at 1.41 million hours watched per episode, followed by Supercell at 1.24 million hours watched per episode. Receiver, which is another show on Netflix, comes in third place at 1.16 million hours watched per episode, followed by Your Honor at 739,160. 67 hours per episode. Desperate Lies is in fifth. The Boys is in sixth. The Bear is in seventh. Vikings Valhalla comes in eighth place. Bridgerton comes in ninth. And Netflix's revival of The Mole rounds out the top 10. And speaking of The Boys, when we look at the most watched original streaming series of 2024 through July 14th, The Boys has moved up to number six, the sixth most watched original show of the year at 97.3 million hours. The Gentleman, Reacher, Evil, and Three Body Problem all take a step down. And The Boys is rapidly approaching Avatar, The Last Airbender, to become the fifth most watched original streaming series of the year. We're approaching the end of the season as far as the Nielsen reporting goes, but there is still a little bit of gas left in the tank for The Boys. Finally, I just wanted to notice something very odd that happened this past week. You could call it a strange occurrence before. This is the chart for the most watched original streaming series since Nielsen began reporting numbers back in 2020. And for months now, Stranger Things has been just behind Ozark for number one on that list. And I figured that's how it would stay until the new season of Stranger Things debuts in let's say 2038. But for some reason, Stranger Things showed up on the overall top 10 and the hours watched were just enough to push it past Ozark and officially name Stranger Things the most watched original series since 2020, and this reporting began from Nielsen. So this is a coronation I thought we'd have to wait again, let's say five to 15 years in order for it to happen. It has now happened at the most unexpected time. So you have a new champ here, Stranger Things, the most watched original streaming series of the past few years, number seven overall. Ozark moves down to number two. It's number eight overall when you look at all streaming series, library or original, and the rest of the top 10 remains the same. Bridgerton, followed by The Crown and Virgin River, Love is Blind at number six, Manifest at number seven, Cobra Kai at number eight, although it could be moving up the list because we're going to get some watch time for that show pretty soon, Wednesday at number nine, and The Great British Baking Show, so delightful there, at number 10. And that wraps us up for this week. Just a quick snapshot at some of the things you can look out for this upcoming week in theaters and on streaming. Lawrence of Arabia has one last showing tonight as part of a Fathom event. I haven't gotten much of a report about the quality of the film. Fathom has a spotty track record there, so buyer beware. But seeing Lawrence of Arabia on a big screen, I think is a must for any cinephile. This Wednesday on Apple TV Plus is the debut of Bad Monkey. Vince Vaughn stars in a new series from producer Bill Lawrence, who brought us Ted Lasso, among other things, about a cop turned health inspector investigating a disappearance in Florida. This is based on the popular novel. Coming up this Thursday on Amazon Prime is the debut of Jackpot. Paul Feig is directing this movie, starring Aquafina, John Cena, and Simu Liu, which is set in a near-future LA about a lottery winner who has to survive until sunset to claim her winnings. And you know what? It's great to see Aquafina and John Cena getting work. You know, you don't see those two in very many things nowadays. So congratulations to Paul Feig for giving two struggling actors a real shot at a breakout hit. Really give them the spotlight because, I, you know, you never see those two. You never see them anywhere. Beginning this Thursday, Coraline returns to theaters for its 15th anniversary in remastered 3D. It will be in wide release throughout the weekend. Also debuting on Thursday on Peacock is Bel Air Season 3, the gritty Fresh Prince show, which is actually a pretty big tongue twister when you try to say it. It debuts its first three episodes this Thursday. It becomes weekly thereafter. Also debuting on Thursday on Netflix is Emily in Paris Season 4, Part 1, the show that helped bring down the Golden Globes, but Netflix is doing that thing that it does where it releases the seasons in chunks. So you're not going to get the whole season four, you're going to get part of it and then have to wait several weeks for the rest of it, which is just a great way to build series momentum. 
I guess, if you're Netflix. Moving on to theaters, opening Friday in wide release is the big theatrical release of the weekend, which is Alien Romulus. I'm gonna try to have a review done when the embargo drops on Wednesday afternoon. I'm gonna be hitting the road actually today to go check out Alien Romulus. This Friday on Netflix is a new film called The Union. Mark Wahlberg and Halle Berry star in a thriller about a construction worker who finds out that his high school girlfriend is a spy and is recruited to save the world's real spies. The movie co-stars J.K. Simmons. Opening in limited release this Friday is Rob Peace, which is directed by Chiwetel Ejiofor and stars Mary J. Blige, among others. The movie's based on a true story and premiered earlier this year at Sundance. Also opening in limited release this Friday is The Deliverance, the latest film from Lee Daniels, starring Andrew Day and Glenn Close, but this is going to be very limited release because it hits Netflix on August 30th. And finally, and I mentioned this earlier, Didi has been in limited release these past couple weeks. It is now expanding to many, many more markets. It's hitting my local market this week, and if it's hitting my market, it's a good chance if you're in a large to mid-sized city that it could be hitting your market. This is one of my favorite movies of the year. It also came out of Sundance. It is worth your time. Check it out if you have a chance to see DD. It's a little movie that could use some attention, and I very much recommend it. And that wraps it up for Charts with Dan this week. Be sure to stay tuned right here for many things, including my review of Alien Romulus. I'm also working on a ranking video for the Alien franchise that includes not just the theatrical cuts of the movies, but also all of the special editions for the first four movies, trying to sort through which ones are worth it, which ones aren't, how do they compare to the other Alien films. I think it's going to be fun, so stay tuned for that later on in the week. Plus, you never know what news is going to break. All kinds of fun stuff. This channel is a crazy madhouse. Thanks so much to my sponsors, Miracle Made and The Perfect Gene. Make sure to check out more about them in the description below. But most of all, thank you for spending part of your day here with me. Until next time, stay safe, and I'll see you then. Bye.